Psalms 2. Psalms 2. Psalms 2. Let's, let's bow down with prayer. Father, I pray the words that come out of my mouth would be your words, Lord, and not the words of man. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive. Holy Ghost, have your way in this place in Jesus' name. For several months now, we have been reading Psalms 2 during the worship service. And I just want to read it to you. Why are the nations in an uproar? Do you know that one of our own presidential candidates, a white boy, if he's black, I call him a black boy, but he's a white boy. He could be a brown boy. John Edwards, whose mom and dad and their mom and dad was from this nation, stood up this week and told everybody that the Jews, that Israel, was the reason for the problems in the world. Here we go again. It's always the Jews. It's always Israel. Why are the nations in an uproar? And the president of Iran said, when I get done with this nuke, this warhead, I'm going to blast Israel off the face of the earth. Jimmy Carter has stood up in the last month or two and wrote a book and said, it's the Jews, it's the Jews, it's Israel. If you've got your ears opening and you're reading newspaper and listening to television and radio, it's the Jews, it's Israel that's the bad boys. And then last week I saw where they were thinking about giving the Nobel Peace Prize to a 96-year-old woman in Poland. And this woman had an underground railroad where she helped 2,500 Jews escape Jewish children and not get killed. And they're talking about her getting the Nobel Peace Prize for what she did after all of these years. And they ask her a question. What would you like to share about what happened? And she said, after all these years, I can tell you that we still have not learned they're getting ready to get the Jews again. Why are the nations in an uproar? I'm going to tell you, if I was preaching a sermon before the whole world, unless God had given me something by revelation and dream or vision or spoke to me in some way, if I just had to go to the Bible and pull out a passage and preach out of it, it would be this one. Because this covers it all. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? Al-Qaeda says, we are going to blow up the West because they support Israel. And that America is nothing but a bunch of Jews in the woods. It, the government in America is neoconservative Israeli Jews Israel. So Al-Qaeda said we're going to blow up the rest of the world until America stops supporting Israel. And then the Palestinians say, and Hamas and Hezbollah say, we're going to kill everybody we can get our hands on 
until they stop supporting Israel and we can make Israel give us their land. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? Now you got to understand that King David wrote this. But you got to understand that God told him to write it. He's saying, why are the nations mad? And God is saying, why are the people devising a vain thing? God is saying, why are the people so stupid that they're coming up with something stupid to do? Like, when I was a little boy, God forbid, but if it ever entered my mind to beat up my daddy so he wouldn't give me a whipping, how stupid. And God is sitting in heaven and going, why do the nations imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand. Most of the kings of the Middle East have said, America, if you will stop supporting Israel, we won't blow you up anymore. The kings of the world have dropped out one by one away from the United States with what they're doing because they call us that we are lovers of Israel and if we would stop doing that, the rest of the world would quit acting up. The kings of the rulers take their rulers take their stand. Chavez down in South America, a Shinashan a jihad in in uh, uh, Iran. Uh, everybody is talking about what they're going to do to Israel and what they're going to do to America. And even America, with Condoleezza Rice. And our president and vice president are telling Israel now you've got to give in to international will. You've got to get together with these people and give them something that will make everybody happy so we can stop all this bloodshed. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together, all the presidents of the countries, all the kings. If you turn it on the nightly news, they're having meetings and they're talking about what must be done to stop Israel from causing everybody from killing each other because Israel exists. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, the word Lord there is God. There is no other Lord other than God. And God came down on Mount Sinai and talked to Moses. And then God came down one more time in the body of a virgin, impregnated her, was born in the flesh of a man, and lived sinlessly and died in Calvary, shed his blood for the payments of sin. The reason you have such a big gap between Moses and Jesus was the point was to be made that man cannot be forgiven by the law, but the Bible says it's only by the shedding of blood that sin is forgiven. The Bible says that life is in the blood. Somebody had to die to pay for the sin and only the sin, sinless Lamb of God, Jesus, Lord God, could do that. So when it says the next word, against the Lord, that means God, and against his anointed, that is a prophecy of Jesus who died in Calvary, the Messiah, the Savior. Now, this is a Jewish book. And the Jews gave Jesus to the Romans to kill 
1,500 years after this. They wrote the book. God gave it to them to write, but they didn't even recognize he who was of the book when he came, and they put him to death. Why? Because God chose to let his own family put him to death rather than to be put to death by others. We have the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. His brothers threw him in a hole. They were jealous of him. And he was delivered into the hand of a traveling band of merchants. They traveled to Egypt. Joseph rose in power and strength, and he became second in command to Pharaoh. A great famine came into earth. Everybody was dying and starving to death in Israel. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the sons, the fathers, uh, let's go to Egypt and get something to eat. When Jacob's sons got there, the ones that threw their brother in the hole, they found that, that their brother Joseph was over all the food. And so now somebody way in advance who had been beat up and thrown in a hole and forgotten, the brothers didn't know that God allowed them to do it because God had a plan. That was his plan to get him to Egypt to get him in charge so the rest of the family could come down later and have something to eat. And so when Jesus was given over by the Jews to the Romans, it's the same story as Joseph. God had a plan for his own family to do him wrong, betray him, but God had a position he wanted him in that when he was put in that position and he was raised up on a stick on a hill and died at Calvary's blood was shed, all the sins of all men everywhere would be forgiven, those who would come to him. God already had a plan. Even in our lives, there's things that happen, Mr. Simmons. We don't understand why they happen. But later on, further along, we understand all about it. But right now, at times, we have questions why God has let things be the way they are. But God does know what he's doing, and he is taking care of his children. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. I saw on television about four years ago two Israeli soldiers who turned a wrong way with their jeep. They wound up in the Palestinian territory. And the world news showed the Palestinians taking broken glass out of the windows and stabbing and slicing the Jewish soldiers to pieces and slamming and beating and cussing and dragging them in the streets tied to their vehicles. Why are the nations in an uproar? Why do they rage? Why are they so angry and mad against God and against his anointed? The law came through Moses Moses was Israel and the Jews. The law came to the earth to tell everybody that came out of the garden through Adam and Eve that they were put out because they were sinners. God sent the law to let everybody know that they were guilty before God and God would have to do something to redeem them back from the devil who stole them, who tricked them and tempted them and messed them up. God loved them and when he loved them, he wasn't going to let the devil's word be the last word. God has a last we have hope because God is love and God never intended to lose and God never loses and it looks like he's losing now but God will win. Amen. Let us tear their feathers apart and cast away their cords from us. This verse speaks specifically to all of the world saying Kill the Jews so we can take the Ten Commandments and grind that stone into powder and throw it off the top of a mountain. Now, with any Jew or Christian, we know that the body of a human being is holy. 
because God made it, God gives, God takes, and blessed be the name of the Lord. And if you didn't give it, you don't have any right to take it. That's why one of the commands says, thou shalt not murder. But the reason that they would like to grind the law to powder and throw it away is the same way that some people, why they get cremated. Some people intentionally want to get away from God. Some people don't know no better. They've been told or they've heard it. They do that. But many people who get cremated, the reason they want to get cremated, they have lived a life putting God out of their mind. And if they get burned up in little ashes and powder and throw it away, then if there really is a God, don't have to worry about it because how can God find their ashes? If you go to the book of Revelation, I believe Revelation 19, God tells everything in the ocean that is human that has died from all eternity to get up. Well, Pastor David, what if a fish, what if a fish ate somebody and then he went to the bathroom and it came out and then another fish ate that? It would, it's no problem with God. God can find it. The Bible said, God said, let there be, and there was, and everything God said is is. And when God calls something, it doesn't matter what form it's found itself to be in at that point, it came from God, it's going back to God. Let us tear their feathers apart. Get rid of the law. Get rid of God telling us what we shouldn't do. Let us establish our own law, laws and rules. What we think is right. What we want. That's what the deal is, is to drive the Jews into the ocean. To say that their God was not God. And God did not appear on Mount Sinai to Moses. But he did. The same way he appeared at Calvary in Jesus. This is an anti-Christ message this morning. It doesn't matter that they would keep the Quran if they got rid of the Jews and the Christians and got rid of the Bible. God didn't write that. They're going to kill you, Pastor David. My daddy told me when I was a little boy, you have to die someday, and a whipping only hurts for a little bit. The Bible says the first person in hell is a coward. Do you understand? Yes. You find out whether you believe what you're standing on. You'll never drive the Jews in the ocean. You'll never kill all of them. No matter how many times in this life the nations of the earth have tried to annihilate and destroy the Jews, they've never been able to do it because there is eternal as the word of God that was spoken by the eternal God that spoke it. The Jews represent the feathers and the cords of God. That God is the ruler and sovereign over all. God watches and sees. God knows that he's in control. We read in the book of Revelation where the whole earth is on fire and terrible death and terrible calamities happen. The thing is, God writes in advance what's going to happen. And if God writes in advance what's going to happen, he must be in control of it. So whatever appears to be out of control is exactly in control. And the child of God, the child of Jesus, the Jew of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knows that his God reigns and is in control. For instance, Jehovah's Witness is Antichrist. They say Jesus is not God in the flesh. The Muslims say they believe in Jesus, but they say he's a prophet. But he's not God, and his blood cannot save you from your sins. The Jehovah Witness says they believe in Jesus, but he's not God. And your works get you to heaven rather than the blood he shed. This last world religion will comply. will put great religions from all around the world together. That believe by your good behavior you get to heaven. That will rule out the blood of Christ. That God paid the price. Some way man's selfish righteous opinion feels like he has to pay what he cannot pay. That only God can pay because only God is righteous. We 
were kicked out because we were not righteous, we will be brought back in by his righteousness and nothing else. The Bible says salvation is not by works of righteousness, least any man should boast, but it is the free gift of God. Verse 4, to all of those who want to kill the Jew and the Christian. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger. Right now the Muslims have a mosque on the top of Mount Zion. And they forbid the Jews to go up there and pray. So the Jew stays down below with the bricks and the blocks at the rail on the wall praying because the Muslims said you can't go up there and pray. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. Do you know that the Jews in Israel have enough firepower to kill every Palestinian Arab in the country of Israel in, before you could blink an eye and own everything and not have to answer to anybody? And they listen to these people. waiting on God to make the change because deep down the Israelis know no matter who you are, Jew or Gentile, Palestinian, American, British, whatever you are, life is precious and God gave that life and we all came from the same life and started in the Garden of Eden. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. That mountain does not belong to the Americans. That mountain does not belong to the Arabs. That mountain does not belong to the British or the Chinese. That mountain does not even belong to the Israelis. That mountain belongs to God Almighty who met Moses on Mount Sinai. That mountain belongs to God who sent his son Jesus to live and die. And that mountain will be set on by his anointed, his son Jesus. And Jesus will reign and rule from there. Verse 7. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, thou art my son. The spirit of prophecy is speaking. David is speaking. But Jesus, the spirit of prophecy is speaking. You remember when Jesus got baptized? The Holy Ghost ascended like a dove and they heard from heaven. This is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. Here we are in the Old Testament. The spirit of prophecy speaking again through the prophet David. This is my son. I will sit on my hill. Today I have forgotten thee. The only, the New Testament, he's the only begotten son. Meaning he is God in the flesh. Begotten of God, God in the flesh. <laughs> Jesus has all the power of God because he is God. That's why he was able to forgive sin on earth. That's why the Jews put him to death. They saw him tell the lame man, your sins are forgiven you. And the preacher said to him, boy, what right do you have to forgive sins? Only God can do that. And he says, it is as easier for me to tell him his sins are forgiven or get up and walk. And he said, get up and walk. And the man stood up. He not only said he was God, he proved he was God in everything that he did. It's interesting on 
earth. We fight with the sword. The Bible says that when Jesus comes back, he will fight with the sword of his mouth. <coughs> he says he will whoop Satan with the very breath that comes out of his mouth. I recently had somebody breathing in my face. I tried to walk in love, but I was glad when they quit breathing in my face because their breath didn't smell very good. But that ain't going to how be how Jesus comes back with his breath. His is going to be holy breath, righteous breath, awesome breath. Sweet bread. So sweet and righteous, the wicked cannot stand before it, but will die and crumble before the holy righteousness. There is no death in God in his life. The smell of life in Christ will be all it takes to defeat Satan in his wickedness. Somebody dies and you smell their dead, stinking body. God is so sweet, he's so much like to be anywhere near the presence of God is to smell a smell that you can never imagine in all of eternity. He's the sweetness of anything that was ever sweet and wonderful and great and good. In the same way that his sweetness raises the dead, his sweetness will put it to death the wicked. I've been in this church service and I've seen somebody sing. And I've watched them cry and God break their heart in the Holy Ghost. And people start crying all over the auditorium and the heart breaking and God deal with them. And somebody in the back that's headed for hell who doesn't want to repent, just get up and run out of the church. Just mad and angry, dead standing because of that sweetness of the Lord. If you go to go to heaven, the things of God will draw you. You'll want them. If you're going to hell, you're repulsed by it. You're running away from it. You don't want it. And the Bible says that no man comes to the Father except through the Son. And no one can come to the Son unless the Father draws him. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as I inheritance in the very ends of the earth as I possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt shatter them like earthenware. Talking about Jesus when he reigns and rules. Now, therefore, O kings, that means President Bush, that means President Jacahai. That means Chinese Prime Minister. That means the British Prime Minister. That means everybody in authority everywhere. Show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son. Even the Jews, God has blinded them. Like the boys who do drug Joseph in the well, in the hole. Jealous of him. The Muslims say God does not have a son. The Jews say God does not have a son. Only the Christian says God has a son. Even King David the prophet, he knew God had a son because God showed it to him in the spirit. That's why the Holy Ghost wrote this. Do homage to the son. He hadn't even come yet. David prophesied about the resurrection. David prophesied about the crucifixion. David saw it 1,500 years in advance. 
Jew man. He was outside the temple and Mary carried Jesus to have the rights done over him of every good Jew boy in the temple. And the old man was standing outside the temple and he saw the little boy. He said, oh, hallelujah. I got to live to see the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Deliverer of Israel. And every Jew knows the Deliverer of Israel is God Almighty. Do homage to the Son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. The Lamb of God who came and died for the sins of man, Jesus. Who when he was being beat did not even speak back. When he was dying for the sins of rest, of rest of men, with no sin in his own heart, he did not rail. He went to the slaughter as a sheep because he knew his mission. He knew he had to die for someone else. So he went with love in his heart to do that. He came in his mercy and the grace of God. But when he comes back the second time, he's coming back as a ruling mighty king. He's coming back as a warrior to take the wicked down and establish this the righteous rule in Christ this morning. When he comes back, will you be ready? Will you accept him? Have you accepted him? Have you realized that the Bible of the Jew and the Christian says that Jesus is God? Have you recognized that the Arabs say he is not God, but they believe in him? They're liars. They come against what God's word says. Do you recognize many religions in America, from Jehovah's Witnesses to Mormons to even people who call themselves Christians and Christian churches, do they not? Do not acknowledge that Jesus is God in the flesh. Only God can forgive sin, and that's why Jesus died. Amen. Do homage to the Son, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in the Son. Right now around the world, the Muslim don't lay down and let anybody kill them. The Christian does. But God's going to reverse it. Because the Christian believes when the Bible says, vengeance is mine, that's what God meant. The Christian believes when the Bible said, thou shalt not murder, that's what God meant. So God's going to come through Jesus, his mighty son, at the second coming and do all the killing for everybody because he is truly righteous enough to do it. And it'd be righteous when he do it. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in the Son. Turn with me to the book of 1 John, please. First John chapter one. First John chapter one. We beginning with verse one. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld with our hands, handled concerning the word of life. This is John who wrote the book of Revelation. He's saying what we have seen, we saw Jesus. What we've heard, we heard Jesus. And what we put our hands on when he was on earth, John the Revelator said, we put our hand on Jesus, God, Messiah, in the flesh. 
and the life was manifest and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. He just said eternal life is with the Father, but he said the eternal life was manifested to us. That was Jesus, that was God in the flesh. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship, everybody say, our fellowship is with the Father. Our fellowship is with the Father. And with His Son, Jesus Christ. With His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things, these things. We, write we write, that our joy, that our joy may, be may be complete. You don't have joy in the Lord unless you've been born again. And the only way you can be born again is recognize that Jesus is God in the flesh and that he came to pay for your sin. That when you see Jesus, you're looking at God Almighty because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that strength is in the Son. Now, look over in chapter 2. Verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist, everybody throws that term around Antichrist. Let me, let me put it in perspective for you what it means. Antichrist means you do not believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. It's not some movie out of Hollywood. This word comes out of the Bible. Antichrist means that you do not believe that God sent his son in the flesh to die for the sins of man and shed his blood as the payment to be able to enter into eternal life with God the Father. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen from this, we know that it is the last hour. You say, Pastor David, this was nearly 2,000 years ago, and he said it's nearly the last hour. The Bible says one day is like a thousand years with the Lord, and a thousand years is one day, so we're not even in the third day yet, church. That's where most people make their mistakes with God. They say they get saved. They say they believe in the Lord. And then they come to the church and they want to tell the pastor and tell the church how things ought to be. Other than just accept God, your ways are higher than mine. Show me how this thing works. Show me how you move, God. Show me how you work, God. Show me how you speak, God. I just got saved and I'm coming in here and telling everybody what it is. That's mess. When you come to God, God, show me. They went out from us. But they were not really of us. Michael Jackson was raised in a Christian home. Michael Jackson then went into Mormonism, which does not believe that Jesus is God. Now the last word is Michael Jackson is getting ready to move to be a Muslim. Prince was raised in a Christian home. Left it. He's now a Jehovah's Witness, an ordained minister, and one of the nastiest, filthiest men on earth. At the Super Bowl, he played a guitar shaped like a man's phallus. It's going to be these people who will raise up the song in the last days across the board for whites and blacks and browns alike to come against those who believe in Jesus as God. They are going to lead an army of rebellious young people across this world that will tear down everything they can tear down and destroy what is really of God. Your music either leads to the worship of God or it leads to the worship of man. An ordained minister being nasty. We arrest ministers in Fort Worth for being nasty, but we put a minister on the Super Bowl being nasty. You know what the Bible says happens to a nation 
before they go into captivity and another nation takes them over? When this gets ready to go down, people start shaving their heads. Women will have their heads shaved when the occupiers come in. They will be roped and they will drag with no clothes. Men, the mighty men, will be put in chains and be paraded off. Recently I saw where a famous woman in America, the whole world is talking about her because she got out of a car with a short dress and when she threw her leg open, she showed she had no underclothes on so the whole world could see her nakedness. The Bible says God always reveals your nakedness to the world when he's fixing to whip you and do something bad to you. See, if you come to Christ, the first thing you need to do is realize you don't know nothing but Christ and you believe what He did and then say, Lord, teach me and show me. If they had been with us, they would have remained with us. I have not changed since I was saved in 17 in 1972. I believe the same Bible. Ain't one day I believed about this Bible was wrong, but I know more than I used to know. All I did when I got saved was believe it. But the more I believed it, the more I saw of it and understood and realized what it meant. I don't read the Bible, interpret it, and tell you what I think it says. I read the Bible and tell somebody this is what the Bible says. If you don't come that way, you'll leave out from what he said and say what you think. You're not on the same team as the one who wrote it, God. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. I saw of a man named Kennison, a white boy. He was in the Pentecostal religion. His wife divorced him. He got out of preaching. He used to preach hellfire and brimstone, but he wasn't really saved. He went into being a comedian. He was famous for being nasty, ugly, filthy, and a redneck. And at 38 years old, he was killed out on the freeway. And they say before he died, he was walking around talking to himself, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. Oh, in my lifetime, the people I've seen turn away from the Lord Jesus and walk away and then get a phone call about what happened to this apostate person. When you find Jesus, you find the parable of the pearl of great price. I was saved at 17 and I messed up and done some wrong things. And sometimes I said, man, the way I'm acting, Lord, but I have never, ever thought there was anything other than Jesus. And I've gotten older and older. He's more precious and important to me now than ever. If you really know him, you know him. If you know him, you know him. No matter what happens in your life, you don't stop knowing him. They would have remained with us, but they went out in order that it might be shown they are not all of us. Man, don't get upset when people leave the church and say that Jesus thing ain't for me. Man, those are devils. The Bible already said this is going to happen. Wherever the devil is not in a church, the devil is the church. Amen. Wherever everybody's happy and nobody's upset, that's the church where the devil is. Paul said he knew there was division in the church because he said that's how you prove who really is of the Lord. So next time you say, I'm not going to church because they're arguing down there. Praise God, they're arguing because they're arguing over two different opinions. They're arguing over what the Bible says and somebody else wants something else. It's the church you got to watch out for. It's where you go in, ain't nobody got no opinion. Brother, whatever you think, whatever you think, that's great. And everything's wonderful. Everybody's heading to hell in a handbasket. But listen, it is if you're born again. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth. 
but because you do know it, know it and because no lie is of the truth. The Bible is not written to those who leave the church. The Bible is not written to those who leave the church and don't want anything to do with the church. The Bible is written to those in the church and those who want something to do with the church. Now run and tell that one to all your good friends. Go to hell out there all by yourself. Go around and preach that old drunken gospel. Hey man, I don't have to be in church to be saved. You go on and you tell that stuff and you tell everybody. But I'm telling you, the Bible is not written for those who don't need the church or want the church. It's written for those who do want it and need it. Amen. <laughs> who is the liar? The one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Every Jew knows Christ means God. That's why the Jews gave him to the Romans to get him killed because Jesus said he was God. The Muslims say, oh, we love Jesus. He's a prophet. You liar. Jesus said he was God. He got killed for saying he was God, not for saying he's a prophet. The Muslims honor prophets, but they did not honor Jesus is God, and they don't today, but I do, and everybody who's been born again and washed in the blood does. <laughs> who is the liar? Now, the man who is writing this is John the Revelator, the one who wrote the book of Revelation, the one who laid his head on Jesus' bosom and was called the beloved disciple. Bosom means prophesy, and that's exactly what John did. He was close to the heart of God. Who is the liar? Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, Islam, anybody who says Jesus is not Christ is the liar that is Antichrist. Pastor David, they'll kill you. Everybody's got to die one day. And my Bible says the first one in hell is a coward. Yeah. You've got guts to kill people in the name of your religion that's taking you to hell. i got guts to die in the name of my God and go to heaven. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Everybody say, this is, this is the Antichrist, the, Antichrist. the one who denies the Father and the Son. The Muslims say God has no Son. The Jews say God has no Son. The Christian knows he does. Everybody say, if what? If what? You heard, you heard 
from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. It tells us you don't abide in the Father and Son by saying you abide in the Father and Son. You abide in the Father and Son by if you abide in what you heard from the beginning. They come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Many churches even in America that's not even Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostal, you name it. They don't abide in what was heard from the beginning. Denominations are headed to hell everywhere. Have you been born again? And this is the promise which he himself made to us. Eternal life. That if we abide in what we've heard from the beginning, if nobody can talk us out of the precious blood of Jesus, that that's what pays for the sins of man, then guess what? And this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. you got eternal life. And the Bible tells every born-again Christian, you have passed from life, and life into death already. You're already living it. If you've been born again, you're already doing it. You're already there. All you're waiting to do is put off this mortal body where you can see him face to face and be there. Verse 26, these things... Everybody, these things, these things I have written to you, written to you concerning, those concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Do you think that speaks for itself? Yes. And as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. I was born again, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. I was born again because God spoke to my heart when I heard the word of God. God revealed himself to me in the flesh. I recognized that Jesus was the Son of God, God Almighty in the flesh. And I'm abiding in that. I'm in the vine. The branch abides in the vine or it doesn't bear any fruit. And I'm still abiding in the same Jesus I got at 17. And I don't care how fancy they get. I don't care what they say and how mean with their swords and their guns. I don't care how they close in on me. Jesus closed in on me when I was 17 when I got saved. And he wrapped himself around me like a cocoon. And he made me a brand new creature and gave me a brand new heart. Made me a brand new person. And every day of my life I live, I'm always aware of that. I've always got him on my mind at one time or another that I am his beloved. Hello? And my beloved is mine. I know who I belong to. You Do you know who you belong to this morning? Or are you trying to figure what denomination you want or who's teaching you want? I'm telling you, if you're going to heaven, God's going to speak to you this day and let you know that you can have your life with Christ. All you got to do is say, I receive, Lord. I'm accepting what I'm hearing. I know it's truth. And now little children abide in him. What does that mean, church people? Believe what's written in the book. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Man, you'll go to churches today, they'll be singing and shouting hallelujah. And they'll be reading poems from the pulpit. You'll be hearing about them preaching doctrines about living good, living this, and if you live good enough, you'll go to heaven. <clears throat> and then you'll hear others say, no matter what you do, you go to heaven. 
You can just live like hell and get to heaven. But let me tell you something, church. If you live like hell, you're going to hell. And as far as works goes, the Bible says salvation is not by works, least any man should boast, but it is the free gift of God. Is God calling you this morning? Is he speaking to your heart and asking you to open up and let him in? Come to Jesus this morning. If you know that he is righteous, everybody, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him, let us stand. If by the foolishness of this preaching, this foolish story that educated Gentiles and Jews and Mormons and Jehovah's Witness and Islam, and it's just it's just too silly. Somebody goes, Oh, bah humbug. Can't no man die and let, let his blood be shed to pay for your sins. I don't want to hear no mess like that. But you know what's really silly to me? is that you think by getting down on a rug five times a day that that's going to make you right with God. I used to vomit on rugs. I need something rather than what's below. I need Him who came from above. I need God from above to come into my heart. I don't have it in me to get above. I need somebody to come down and get in my heart and make me that new creature. And Jesus is ready to do that this morning if you'll ask him into your heart. If you want to be saved this morning, I'll pray with you the sinner's prayer. I want you to come stand underneath one of these crosses on both sides of the wall. There's a place that you can come to Calvary, that place of shame, that silly place that everybody thinks is so silly that somebody died can pay for your sins. If you believe in the foolishness of the preaching, if you believe in that silly cross, somebody died that you get to go to heaven come to Jesus this morning. For all of those of you that that's still silly, stay right where you're at, okay? Come to Jesus this morning. Come to Jesus. Whoa.